Hi, it's Micah Colley with the Haas Hopcast. Welcome back to this episode, our post-harvest recap with Pete Mahoney, Vice President of Supply Chain, the farm from Haas. How are you, Pete? Doing well, Micah. So a 45-year veteran of the hop industry, and we just found out recently through our company newsletter, 35 of those years with John I. Haas. Yeah, time flies. Doesn't uh, seem like it's been that long, but uh, yeah, started out in Oregon as a kid working on a hop farm as a summer job, and uh, Kind of led to a full career in hops and uh, been with Haas. This is my 35th year, so it, uh, it's been a fun ride. That is that is a fast, long, long, fast ride. You you almost look too young to say, when I say 45 <laughs> years. You're like, well, I did start right, yeah, right out of the Started gate. Young. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Well, glad to have you, and I always appreciate your insight on the market and sure. especially what's happening with hop growers. The last 10 years, we've had this bull market in craft and this boom around the hop industry. It's really reinvigorated farms. Uh, alongside of that has been all these uh, food safety issues and global gap certifications and a lot happening, I guess, in the hop industry with growers. How would you say these last couple of years as we're kind of leveling off with this pandemic on acreage, uh, your view on how we got to 60 plus thousand acres of hops in the Northwest and uh, 100 million pounds plus the last few years? Yeah, no, it's really been a, an interesting uh, run. You know, craft uh, came in at the right time about 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago. The uh, the U.S. industry was was heavily planted to high alpha. Um, back in 2008, eight nine, we knew that we were in another oversupply situation with high alpha. A lot of acres came out of the ground at that point in time. Um, you know, and we were down, uh, you know, below 30,000 acres in the U.S., and it didn't look so uh, so rosy on the horizon in those days, uh, but then here came this this uh, craft market, um, which you know we wondered at that time: is it going to stick around? Uh, you know, is it going to pull us out of this uh, downward cycle that we were going into after uh, again over over a planting with high alpha? Um, but yeah, it's it's really been a, a nice run of of ten years. You know, we've since that period of time uh, back in. I think 2011 was the low point of acreage uh, in recent years. Um, and since 2011, we've increased acreage for 10 straight years until 22 crop. But, uh, but yeah, we, we knew that, uh, you know, that, that, that strong growth couldn't last forever. And it's, it's definitely slowing down. And then COVID hitting when it did didn't really uh, help matters either. But, uh, yeah, we're getting through it. No, it's always interesting, the outside factors and pressures on, on the markets and how that impacts the decisions that are made, because I've always talked about, at least in the industry, this timeline of when decisions get made for hop growers. I mean, really, we've had uh, these La Nina winters you've been t telling us about the last couple of years, and one more is anticipated, but you have a lot of nice warm weather to make to make changes right after harvest this last year, like Crop 22. Growers are probably wanting to know, all right, I've got this this window before it gets cold and before we need to make final decisions on spring planting. So have you seen that impact the industry the last couple of years? Well, that that's pretty <clears throat> typical for this time of year. Uh, you know, we just get the hops in the barn and, and we're trying to get all the numbers reconciled. And, you know, that, this is now a early October time frame. Um, you know, we're trying to get the numbers together for getting ready for our grower payments and so forth. So a lot of, you know, even though the harvest is done and like I said, the hops in the barn, there's a lot of, the the number crunching and all that kind of work uh, is being done um and we're still still doing that right now but i tell you i, I get calls daily from growers wanting to sit down now and talk about 20, 23 crop you know and like you said the weather's been great uh we had really a fairly warm nice dry uh, fall you know after harvest so it was a great opportunity to get out in the fields to you know do do uh, work to get ready for 23 crop whether it's uh, changing out acreages you know to switching out varieties uh, even our own home farm, uh, the Haas farm, uh, have our, our farm manager, Mark Sexer, calling me frequently, you know, wanting to know, well, what do I need to change for next year? And uh, so the, there's a lot of those conversations going on right now. Um, so it's it's actually quite busy now getting ready for next year's crop already. All right. That'll set the table for what's coming up. Now let's look at crop 22 and what actually happened. So a lot of predictions around um, how much we were going to yield this year, maybe on total pounds, and then that varietal spread. So as the craft industry obviously brought back a lot more acreage, it's also brought on this varietal shift where Citra Mosaic have been leading the pack and other aroma varieties like Amarillo, El Dorado have been coming up. You've seen kind of Cascade Centennial slip down the top 10 list. They're in the mix, obviously, and then CTZ. 
uh, is up there as well. But how did this crop 22 look from a, a varietal acreage perspective? So total number of acres and then kind of what was what was leading the leading the charge? Yeah, for total total acreage, you know, and I, I like just to round off the numbers, but we we really were about at about sixty one thousand acres for twenty two crop. Um, that, uh, or I'm sorry, that sixty one thousand acres for twenty one crop last year. Uh, we were expecting to see maybe a, a five percent decrease of acreage this year for twenty two, but it actually went down only by about two percent. Uh, so we were you know, around 60,000, a little under 60,000 acres. But uh, under the hood there of that 2% decrease, actually aromas went up 2% and high alphas went down 16%. So it was about 1,000 acres out of aromas and about, uh, or I'm sorry, 1,000 acres increase of aromas and about 2,000 acres out of high alphas. So uh, so pretty good cut there to high alpha acreage. But um yeah, within the the aroma changes there, yeah, we we definitely saw some slowdown in the, uh, you know, the the growth that we've seen in recent years. But uh, yeah, still again, not quite as much of a trim that we thought that we'd see there in twenty two crop. Maybe part of that is the market hasn't fully come back from the pandemic because we're talking about infrastructure and it's pretty pretty expensive to put in put in new acreage and then when if you gotta take that in, take that out year after year with the yeah. crop, it it. You know, you need babies a couple of years to get mature, and so it's interesting this this slight decrease and the response to what's happening in the market um, and why things are happening. So c certain aroma varieties had to increase. I saw some numbers where you look at the variety and you're like, oh wow, okay, they jumped yep. up, and then other varieties where you go, oh, they came down. Yeah, in the last four years, you know, we've seen the the big public varieties we're on a pretty good uh, decline. You know, Cascade, Centennial, Chinook. Um, yeah, they they were on a steady decline for four years. And, and we knew that they were reaching a point of kind of getting into proper balance. And so, uh, you know, some of that, that, that uh, was hit the year before and then this year a little bit more. But uh, Cascade actually was the largest uh, increasing variety of the aromas this year. Um, I think Cascades went up by about 750 acres. But but even so, um, you know, I think that still was needed. You know, Cascades st seem to be in pretty good balance. Um, but it's the bigger proprietary varieties that were, you know, the big uh, growth leaders in the last uh, five years or so, Citra, Mosaic, and some of the others uh, that um, are the ones that that slowed down and, and actually were pretty flat in terms of acreage change for this year versus last year. And then even some of the other you know, leading proprietary varieties uh, took a pretty good cut this year of maybe 10 to 15% of acreage. Okay, that's just hops in the ground. Now let's get to maybe early spring of 22. You're heading into April and you have this freeze at a very late time in the season, I would say, or early time, I guess, is, depends on how you want to describe that, but I guess abnormal. Yep, yep. No, we uh, were looking at it. Last year, we had a La Nina winter again. It was the second in a row and normally La Nina's bring uh, more moisture cooler temperatures to the nor northwest so it generally leads to no issues for irrigation supply for the the upcoming growing season so yeah we had a, a pretty good La Nina and uh, but it, it lasted longer than we expected so uh, it was a prolonged one into the spring and so that led to a cooler wetter spring as well so sure we, we weren't concerned about water there was plenty of water supply for this year's crop, but uh, but due to the cool, wet spring and and it uh, being so prolonged like that, it uh, delayed the start of the growing season. So we we knew from the get go that uh, babies didn't look good at the beginning. Uh, you know the mature fields got off to a slow start, but you know hops are a pretty resilient plant, and we we felt well, you know once we get into warmer weather, you know for sure the mature fields would. Uh, you know, catch up. And um, that appeared to be the case for most of the summer, but in the end, it really didn't pan out that way. So as they're starting to to grow and develop cones and and do their thing, so to speak, you get hit in the summertime with this heat dome or heat wave, which we've seen in the past, especially last year, it was extremely hot, like 115. These are very high temperatures for the Yakima Valley. Hops don't mind heat, but it seemed like they were impacted uh, so they're already late getting started, and then they were hit with this with this heat wave that lasted a little longer than we thought. 
Yeah, we, we thought actually the heat wave was a good thing. We, we thought that was what the crop needed to get caught up. Uh, again, we were tracking it, looking to be a week behind schedule, you know, going into July. Uh, you know, even in August, it looked a little bit behind. So, uh, you know, generally heat will will speed up the growth of, of the crop. Um, but that that just really didn't seem to happen this year. So going into harvest then, you know, a lot of the growers started maybe five days later than normal. Uh, so that was a sign that the, the crop just really wasn't uh, mature at the normal time frame, you know, uh, per the calendar and and not quite ready to be picked. Uh, and then even during harvest, at the beginning of harvest, we even had some growers shut down for a few days waiting for the crop to, to finish maturing, which is really unusual and, and quite challenging. You know, once you get your full crew, fire up the, the facilities, you know, it's hard to you know, put that on pause for a few days and, and wait for the uh, the crop to catch up. But uh, some of that occurred as well. You're probably up against some varieties that would mature early and need to come off and then others that need to sit sit a little longer or continue to ripen, get them where they need to be. But as you, as you said, once you start, you're getting your kilns filled up, you're mo- moving through the process and the varieties, and it's hard to start, stop, and yep. And get everything picked in in the right window that it, it needs to be picked the, the variety specific. Yeah, that's a big challenge every year nowadays for growers. You know, we we have 70, 75 commercial varieties that we're growing now. Uh, you know, the balancing these picking windows is is a very difficult thing to do for growers. And then you throw in some uh, twists from Mother Nature on top of that. You know, where the normal normal uh, picking windows aren't uh, going to apply this year for some varieties. And then it forces growers to jump around outside of their normal program. And um, but this year, what we saw too, the the, the cone sizes were quite variable. Uh, with a lot of varieties, they were a little smaller. Um, the uh, again, the the ripeness seemed to be a little bit out of sync with the normal schedules. So so yeah, it was a challenging year from that aspect. Um, you know, for the growers to to hit hit the timing just right. But one thing I, I think we felt was a, a positive is many years, you know, all of a sudden the crop, like during harvest, is it just ripens all at once. You know, it's it's uh, ready to be picked right now, all the varieties, you know, within a, a couple week window. And it, that's really difficult. But this year, at least things held off nicely. We didn't see that see that uh, accelerated ripening that we've seen in the past. So uh, I think things held pretty well this year. Um, and maybe part of that was due to, you know, we really didn't have quite that extreme heat that we had the year before. These are those challenges around an agricultural crop that has a lot of variables affecting it. Obviously, weather being one, a smoke was not a factor this year. You did have some wildfires late in the season, but nothing that impacted the, uh, at least the quality of what, what we've seen, aroma and quality of the hops that were on the table or that are going to be processed from crop 22. That's a good thing. Yep, for you, sure. You heard that from growers as well? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, we, we were hoping that the smoke thing wasn't going to become the new norm. You know, two years in a row, 20 and 21 crop, you know, smoke was really quite an issue for us in the Northwest. And, you know, mainly from, you know, local fires in, in the Northwest in Oregon and Washington. Uh, but fortunately, uh, we didn't have that this year. We, there were, you know, fires down in California. I think one down in Southern Oregon, you know, maybe some, some up uh, Northern Idaho. But really, uh, it wasn't... A problem we we had some you, you could see higher level smoke but it really didn't come down low like it did in years past and uh yeah we we had no issues whatsoever with with the smoke taint smoke in the, the uh, hops nice to have that relief this year yeah <laughs> let's talk about things that are impacting growers and we knew labor costs were going to begin to rise with this mandatory overtime in washington state and obviously fuel costs and material costs and all the other things that kind of go into it is a very labor intensive crop where growers expressing some concern around, you know, how, how am I going to keep my pricing in line and continue to make money? And is that affecting some varieties that may need to come out or size of farms as we look ahead to crop 23 potentially? Yeah. You know, I, th- I think it's going to become more of an impact next year. Uh, you know, certainly, the the costs are are hitting the growers this year, but say from a contracting standpoint, you know most of this year's crop was already contracted, you know earlier in the year or even you know from a, a year or two prior. Uh, so I, I would say it was heavily sold, you know, at the beginning of the growing season. Um, but it, it's it's more of a hit into the growers, and and again not a, a 
an impact to contract pricing because that, that was pretty well locked in. Um, but yeah, the big thing for, for Washington this year was the overtime kicked in for the first time. So yeah, any, anything over 55 hours a week was, was time and a half. Uh, that, that was quite a, a hit to growers and especially at harvest time when you're working the long hours, uh, you know, I think some growers were trying to maybe look at some, some, uh, ideas where, you know, if you could add some additional shifts, you know, some, some, some ways to try to reduce the uh, the amount of overtime hours, but that that's hard to do, and and uh, when when maybe go down that path a little bit, that it's a little more uh, challenging to retain the workers. The workers they they're used to working long hours and and want those hours, and so if you start trimming that back, uh, they might head down the road and and find work elsewhere. So, uh, but yeah, so it was fifty five hours this year. Next year it drops down to forty eight hours. And then the third year, the final year of this three-year phase in in Washington, it's forty hours. Anything over forty hours a week is time and a half. So, so uh, yeah, we're we're on a path that's going to really increase our labor costs. I think labor, if it's not there already, you know, it's it's going to be creeping up on fifty percent of the overall cost of growing hops. Yeah, that's real money when you're talking about how do I remain competitive in a market that's got hops uh, available right now. Now, that could change. I've seen it where you go a couple years, and if you have a bad crop or low yield or something that impacts it, you know, God forbid, a hailstorm or other problems like Europe's seen, a lot of climate issues in Germany, and that can impact the U.S. market I've seen. So let's talk about alpha a little bit, alpha aroma. Right now in the U.S., it's about a 70-30 split. Does that sound? Well, it's more like 80-20, so... um... Yeah, actually, just a shade under twenty percent of the acreage now in the U.S. is planted to high alpha. Uh, you know that, like I said at the start here, uh, you know we we shifted out of high alpha back in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, and uh, over that ten year period that we were quite focused on craft and aroma varieties in the U.S. Uh, that the alpha really shifted, the alpha supply shifted to Germany and and primarily uh, into Hercules, their their main alpha producing variety. But yeah, so we're we're down to about eleven thousand acres in the U.S. is is planted to high alpha, um, and yeah, that's a little under twenty percent of our crop. So, um, yeah, I think some of the bigger buyers of the world are are a bit concerned about that. It, it, you know, putting a lot of the alpha eggs into the one basket now in Germany, and in that basket, of course, you know, only twenty percent of the crop in Germany is is under irrigation, eighty percent is dependent upon mother nature, you know, on, in, with the precipitation. And, um, you know, that showed the risk this year of, of that situation where they had another drought, uh, a drought-like uh, summer, you know, with a very warm, dry summer. And that led to quite a, a poor yield in Germany, um, including the alpha crop. So, uh, yeah, that's it's a little bit of a concern. Yeah, you can you can see even craft brewers are talking about they weren't contracted on varieties like Sots or Tetanang or some of these lager hops that are seasonal and and depending on who you were contracted with, you could see yourself maybe looking for hops that you thought you had or didn't have in some cases. So it's interesting as we try, try to balance the supply, but as the the big the big brewers are looking at alpha and what's out there in the market, what they have on inventory, and what needs to happen, do you see changes coming to the U.S. in the alpha side in this next year? Or you think it'll remain flat? I I think that there will be some some shift back to the U.S. Um, you know, I as we're we're uh, likely a little bit oversupplied now on some of the aroma varieties. Uh, I do think we'll see a little bit of a reduction uh, starting next year in aromas. Uh, there'll be an opportunity to backfill some of that with high alpha. Um, I think there'll be a, an interest, you know, the the risk mitigation interest, you know, to see a few more acres go back into the U.S. for of high alpha varieties. But it's going to really boil down to the the price. And, uh, you know, the growers are going to be saying, uh, show me the money. You know, if, if uh, you want some more of those acres back in, uh, you know, that return's got to be there. And, um, you know, it's... It's like we just we're talking with labor and inflation and you know chemicals and fuel and supplies. Uh, yeah, it's 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 tough, uh, and we we need to see a little higher price in that alpha space. Uh, it is more of a commodity space, so it's it's generally a you know a lower return per acre uh, to the grower for those varieties compared to the aromas for craft. But uh, uh, if if the price isn't there, you know, to cover these costs, uh, you know, the growers. The growers are going to have a hard time putting that in. Yeah, it makes it tough when you're making these decisions, you know, heading into the next crop year and 
not knowing what is going to happen between now and then. And then you kind of have to figure out, <laughs> well, what are we going to do now Yep. with covering spots or... Or are we in an oversupply situation still? And then what other changes need to be made? So it's a big, it's a pretty big effort, I guess, to move the, the Titanic or move the ship uh, quickly or rapidly. Yep, yep, it really is. And, you know, in, in the U.S. or in particular Washington, Idaho, maybe not as much Oregon, given their, they don't get a baby crop the first year. But uh, the U.S. can can swing in acres quickly. Uh they, they've shown that in the past. They can do that in the future. But, uh, you know, really, if, if we are looking at some sort of a, an adjustment, a correction here on the horizon, uh, we, I know the crystal ball gets a little less clear when you look further out. But ideally, if we could be looking at more of where do we need to be in three years' time instead of just next year? Because, you know, we don't want to overreact and, and make some changes that are expensive to make, you know, uh, taking out acres or a variety backfilling with something different. Uh, yeah, there's a big cost to that to the grower and, and you have to absorb a baby crop in the first year. But uh, yeah, we want to try to get it as right as we can for, say, a, a good three-year term. Um, and I know that's that's easier said than done, but ideally if we could you know, try to right size for the next three year period instead of a, a, a quick reaction for just next year. Yeah, definitely the long game in the hop industry and brewing industry. But I think the visibility has become more challenging, especially for craft brewers as their brands have changed and they're trying to figure out what they need of what supply. Obviously, for the macros, it's a little easier to forecast. And especially in Europe, like they contract much further out, and but they pretty much know what they're going to be brewing with which varieties. So let's talk about something fun a little bit, the HBC, the Hop Breeding Company, and John I. Haas is uh, 50% of that that venture there, which manages the varieties, you know, like Citra or Mosaic, Equinot. Um, we got some fun fun varieties coming up, but at our farm, uh, Golding Farm in Toppenish, we put in a new experimental picker. And I was touring folks through this year, and they were just really impressed by this uh, modern, up-to-date, almost custom picking machine for our breeding program, which is working on sustainable new varieties or alpha varieties or uh, varieties with better yield that have the same flavor impact or doing a lot of, Michael Ferguson doing a lot of work on crossing varieties to get a unique aroma variety that could be the next Citra or whatever else. So you're a big part of that project with Mark and the team. And can you talk to us about uh, what, what prompted that? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> no, we, uh, with the breeding program, you know, we always have a, a number of experimental varieties in, in the mix. And, uh, you know, when they start out, they're, they're really quite small. You know, you're, you're going to have just a few hills of a variety or maybe a row or two. Um, but, you know, they're maturing at the same time as the, the commercial field. So we're, our, our uh, main picking machines are focused on picking the commercial field, Citroen Mosaic and all the other varieties. And uh, it, it's difficult to squeeze in just a, a small little experimental of one or two rows in the mix of all that. And so, yeah, for years we've had a very small wolf picker, a, you know, German uh, sourced machine there. It's uh, it's um, seen better days and it's about time to replace that. And so we we decided rather than to purchase a new uh, wolf machine, which they're generally, you know, smaller, they have a number of different sizes. We thought we'd just custom make one. So we uh, worked with a local fabricator and we, we, uh, we, meaning Haas and, and the fabricator came up with the design. It's kind of built off of, you know, a standard sort of a Don Harrer type of uh, design. But it's a little beefier than the the old one we had, and it's it's a great little machine. And, uh, yeah, it's been quite a nice tool to have for our breeding program. Yeah, I was talking to Michael Ferguson, our hop breeder, and Scott Varnum on the agronomy team and uh, how it's got the, the throughput to handle some of those uh, thicker plants or if they've got big leaf matter or more cone density that it can handle those versus some of the ones where you got like two binds and yep. you need to throw them in and dry them and get them in there. We did have the coolest thing. So if uh, uh, most people know like a, a, a 200 pound bale is standard for all the commercial varieties, but this 20 pound baler is the coolest <laughs> little machine, a mini baler. We got, we can even bale it up, get it ready and send it out to the pellet plant or wherever else. That's pretty cool. Yep. Yep. We, uh, we thought we needed to come up with a fun little name for that picker, and I, I don't think we ever did yet. It's just called the little picker right now, but maybe uh, the, the Mica machine or something like that. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> we'll see about that. All right, let's talk about Crop 23, then we'll wrap up. Um, 
as brewers are waiting for consumers to come back and get into some of this demand, I've already noticed uh, a little tug in the market of um, everybody was hedging kind of conservatively, as you're talking about. Yep. So how do growers approach Crop 23? And do you think there could be some shifts potentially, or is it a little a little early to tell what, what might happen? You, you kind of alluded to a potential adjustment if needed, but that has to be done very carefully and kind of uh, strategically, I would say. Yeah, I would say for sure we're going to see some downward adjustments. Um, as we came out of harvest, we're, we're uh, seeing more and more signals of the, the significant structural oversupply of inventory that we have in the industry, and and primarily with aroma varieties. So, you know, we earlier might have thought that uh, the acreage needs to come down in 23 by maybe 10% or so, but uh, no, our views have continued to deteriorate on that. Um, right now, we, we'd uh, estimate that a lot of the aroma varieties, the big aroma varieties, probably need to be uh, taken down by 20 to 30 percent. And I'm talking about big varieties like Citra, Mosaic, you know, some of the top varieties in the U.S. Um, clearly are, are in an oversupply situation. So uh, we have a lot of conversations going with growers right now. Um, but I, I'd say in that, that uh, range of maybe a 20 to 30 percent cut. And ultimately, that, that, that'll impact brewers and the spot market and help things get more in line with supply and demand and, and, and lead to a healthier hot market for everyone. Exactly. I mean, we, we've been around a long time in this industry at, at Haas, and uh, you know we've seen many times before when you go into these softening market cycles, uh, you know the best approach is, is to address it quickly and, and take the lumps that you need to take. Uh, don't, don't drag it out and kind of nibble at it, uh, but... But uh, hit it head on, and uh, that's what we think needs to happen here with Crop 23. How about on the public varieties as well? There's a lot of aroma varieties that were taken out, Cascade, Centennial, Chinook uh, to some extent, but reductions in those varieties that have kind of leveled off, do you think they're fairly balanced? Or Yeah, you know, the, the signs are still there that, you know, the bigger public aromas, uh, Cascade, Centennial, maybe Chinook, um, yeah, they, they took their, their lumps earlier. You know, the last uh, three or four years, you know, the acreage has really dropped on those varieties. And it still seems that at the moment they are in reasonable balance. So I, I'm not thinking there, that we'll see much of a reduction, if any, on those varieties for 23 crop. Um, but it's really the varieties you think back the last five years or more. What are the varieties that expanded most aggressively? And it's those big uh, proprietary aromas. And those are the ones where we've gotten out of balance now. The, those are the ones now that need to uh, be corrected with some reductions and uh, need to do that here fairly soon. Could you see some of these smaller varieties that are maybe, you know, there's not that many acres left, maybe 70 to 100 acres of some of these commercial varieties that have been around a while. Could you see any of those um, potentially becoming a victim of I've got to make changes or open up uh, acreage for fields? Or do you think we're going to continue to be able as an industry to offer, you know, 70 plus commercial varieties in the U.S. roughly? Yeah, I, I do think that there's there's going to be uh, some casualties with the smaller varieties. Um, you know, I, I would say when, when you get into varieties that are smaller than a million pounds, maybe 500,000 to a million pound size, uh, that, that gets a little more challenging uh, as a hop buyer um, and as a grower too to, to be uh, working in that space in a market that's, that's much more uncertain and maybe a more tentative market going forward than the, what, what we saw in the last uh, five to 10 years. So um, yeah, I, I think for sure in that space, it's going to be more challenging uh, purchasing hops as as a, a hop dealer or, or certainly as a brewer. But when you get into the really small ones, you know, below 500,000, um, yeah, I could, I could see where some of the, the smallest may, may not be grown next year um, unless you have a contract. And right now, I think brewers are a little tentative as well and, and not so interested in maybe going out uh, even a year or two uh, with with some contracting. But on the small ones, without that, growers aren't going to grow that open and hop dealers aren't going to buy it on speculation either. You know, we're I think everybody's kind of moving into a little more of a conservative mindset, you know, for the next year. I think we're hoping for some more visibility, obviously, heading into the new year. And I think craft brewers have had just challenge after challenge. Um, hops seem to be pretty stable right now, which is the nice thing. So to recap the Crop 22 numbers, we had 
close to 60,000 acres. Does that sound yep, right? Yep. And 101, 2 million pounds? Yeah, yeah. So we uh, just on the, the volume there, you know, with the, the 60,000 acres, if we had an average yield, average crop, you know, we, we were looking at about 112 million pound crop was our our estimate at the start of the season based on the, the USDA acres. And, and keep in mind, the year before, we had the all-time record, right in the middle of COVID, we had 115.6 million pound crop uh, for 21 crop. So we were we were thinking we're going to have about 112 million. And it looked that way to us at Haas, you know, through most of the growing season. But then as we got close to harvest and into harvest, we definitely could see not going to be 112 million pounds out there. It's, it's, it's coming in light. And they always say, a, you know, a light crop comes in lighter and a heavy crop comes in heavier. Well, I think that played out this year. So uh, the 112, we downgraded to 105. And we were kind of thinking it's going to come down to about 100 million at the start of harvest. And uh, so, yeah, we have some some uh, final estimates that we don't have USDA figures yet. But uh, based on bale counts, uh, it is about a hundred and one point six million pound crop, um, so it's that's that's down about ten percent from the long term average, and that's about twelve percent down from the year before. But keep in mind, we had some acres taken out too. Well, I appreciate your insight on this. I know everyone listening wants to know kind of where this market's going, and that's the big question. But we'll have you back uh, in the spring, maybe after things get kind of settled and set the table for Crop 23. But uh, give our best to the growers. Obviously, incredible uh, people in the hop industry that own these farms, that are working on these farms, and supplying great hops to, to great brewers around the world. So appreciate that that entire thing. Yep, will do. No, we, we couldn't uh, do it without the growers. They, they every year, year in and year out, deal with their challenges and do an awesome job for us. So uh, it's a great industry. Looking forward to having you back on the Haas Hopcast. Thanks again, Pete. Crop okay. 22 is in the barn. Let's get to work on processing these hops and getting them out into beer so we can drink it and enjoy. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Cheers. All right. I well, appreciate you joining us on today's episode. We'll catch you on the next episode of the Haas Hopcast.